is truly important. And don't just take my word for it. Your work is appreciated far beyond the walls of the Commission. Uh, for example, I'm delighted to have with us today Mrs. Joanna Mopes, who is Director General of the Communication of the European Parliament. Indeed, during the last generation of EDICS, our cooperation with the European Parliament um, has become, uh, I think, quite exemplary, has, has become really effective. I'll just quote two examples. Uh, a European Parliament budgetary amendment reinforced our budget for you by one million uh, for this year, so this enables us to do a lot more together. And we have, with the European Parliament, a memorandum of understanding on how the relationships worked, the relationships worked in the framework of the European Direct Information Centres. So, it's no surprise to you that you will have been invited to a reception at the Parliament premises this evening, with the European elections getting ever closer. Your role is only going to get more important. Indeed, people will only vote if they realise how much the EU affects them, what's in it for them, what's at stake, and how it affects their daily lives. And this message you will receive, I think, constantly over the next few months. <coughs> and people, people are, the citizens of Europe, need to feel that their voice is heard. Today, the polls, the Eurobarometers, tell us that only one in three Europeans thinks that their voice counts. With your help, this is something that we can change. Yes, we can. Um, so, when you talk to people, don't just tell them what we have done to them, what we have done for them, sorry. It's a different standard. What we have done for them. Uh, things like cheaper roaming charges, uh, better rights for airline passengers, better protection when shopping online. But also why we have done it for them and how they can get involved in future changes, such as through the European Citizens Initiative and through the ongoing citizens' dialogues in the framework of the European Year of Citizens. In this year, we want to engage more than ever with people, asking them what kind of Europe they want to see by 2020. So there's a, a short term, we're in a crisis, there's a short term aspect, but there's also beyond the crisis, and when we get out of the tunnel of the crisis, we need to have a long term vision. A vision. Uh, this is certainly a challenge. Uh, the number of edicts, which is 499, I think, about, is telling. It's a large number. Um, and by including, uh, by working with Brussels HQ, Parliament and Council, we can reach out to our, our 500 million citizens. So this brings me to my second point. We here in Brussels, um, at HQ of DG Farm and the Commission, are here to help, uh, and I'm sure it's the case with uh, DG Com in the Parliament as, we, uh, as well. We're here to help you out in the field, uh, and we have introduced a number of changes for the new generation of Europe Direct. Number one, the mandate of this generation of centres will be one year longer than the previous one. This gives you more time to build up our partnership with both EU institutions and citizens, and your partnerships with the citizens and with the multipliers in your, in your regions. Number two, we have put in place more flexible financial systems to take the burden off you, the centres. Number three, you can now cooperate more closely with other Commission DGs. So you can cooperate directly with uh, DG, the uh, Director General in charge for regional affairs, for example or the Director General in charge of, of the Digital Agenda, uh, for example, to organize campaigns, communication campaigns. So the new generation of Europe Direct is at the heart of a Copernican shift, putting you and your local knowledge at the heart of our, our communication. Working at local and national level every day, you understand people's hopes and fears on the ground, and they're by no means the same for all Europeans. So we by no means the same for all Europeans. So we appreciate the great depth of diversity that you, you represent as well. Our team uh, in Brussels has designed a system to channel feedback from citizens so that this valuable information is not lost in policy making. 
This will allow us to tailor make communication campaigns which focus on the concerns and needs of local audiences. So this brings me to my third point, putting our plans into action. Um, we are now ready to go, the new generation is ready to go. Uh, I think we should have as our guiding uh, point, or one of our guiding points rather, what President Barroso said in his last State of the Union address, one of, one of the many things he said in that address, and that is that the times of European integration by the implicit consent of citizens are over. We need the explicit consent of, of citizens. That's me. <laughs> he didn't say that. Uh, the last bit. You, in the Europe Direct Network, are in the very front of this drive for a more inclusive and democratic union which listens to its citizens. And I underline, underline the word listens. Uh, as Europe continues further down the road to uh, economic, and monetary and political union, you must help ensure that people have a place to ask their questions and to raise their concerns. It's just one of the many ways to get involved in the democratic life of our union. This brings me to my conclusion. For me, the name Europe Direct Information Centers does not quite do you justice, because you do more than just inform. You communicate, you dialogue, and you listen. I, for me personally, communication is always a two-way uh, system. You must communicate, but you must also listen and hear what the people have to say, pass the feedback back onto us, and in that way we are directing to people all over Europe. You are our ambassadors to Europeans of all ages. So keep, please keep on doing what you are doing with the enthusiasm, with the enthusiasm that you are doing it. Thank you very much. I hope this has become much better. I can only um, encourage you to challenge the organizations that you're working with because though for those of us living and working in the bubble it's a bit like in between elections when you are in the bubble and you come and join us this is a lovely place to share a bubble when you go back to your regions I don't want you to be out of sight, out of mind we are here for you, we have to be here for you in the council the service that we have is small compared to you. We are five people to put where you are 500 for this particular service. But these are excellent people, they are professionals and they very much like to work with the Europe Direct Network. Now the third lesson that I learned is when I was then, a couple of years later, I was head of representation in the United Kingdom as a kind of first ever non-national to take over that kind of a job. But what a cultural experiment. So I taught the country again up and down and uh, I had this particular initiative in mind. I thought to myself that now after all these years of working in this field of information and communication service, I have to really expose myself. So wherever I went, I always went to the Europe Direct Information Centre. We set up that network there then, 2005, 2006. So I went to Newcastle, I went to Cornwall, I went to places like that. And wherever we went there, we opened up structural funds projects. But not only that, we also went to the local BBC station. And my press office had the, uh, the, had the kind of instructions that with them they work out this half an hour to an hour show where I go live to BBC broadcast locally and I can answer all the questions that I get from the citizens. They don't have to send questions beforehand. I'm ready to take them. In the beginning it was a bit scary, I can tell you. I had this bunch of paper with me all the time where I go. The more I did that, the less paper I had. And at the end of the day, after a couple of months, I only had this couple of sheets of paper. And that sheet of paper contained the figures of funding for structural funds for each of the regions concerned. Those I could not memorize. And the reason why I could kind of do away with all the other questions was because even though they were different from one place to another, at heart, 90% of them were of a similar kind. People in the UK were concerned about fraud. They were concerned about bureaucracy. They were concerned about where their money goes to. 
they were talking about the administration, they're talking about how rigid the directives are, how they have been implemented in their country. They wanted to understand why this and why that. And many of these questions that we learned answers to, they were generic to a point and then very particular after that. And that's very much a lesson that I also had. We have to work on a legacy, we have to work on the answers that we can share with others. And I'm not sure that we do that. Now, the three questions. Europe today, looking at all of you here, is pretty grand. I mean, you are a magnificent service, and I really hope that uh, you will appreciate also working with our people and my colleagues at the Council. We answer correspondence in letter by email for the President of the European Council as for the Council and we help the Presidency too. Um, the risk with Europe Direct is that it can start looking like a flagship initiative of an institution or the other. But it should not be surely that. I mean, if the cause is to provide answers to questions and concerns of our citizens, are the institutions even relevant to the cause, apart from funding it? I mean, where are the member states and the authorities and the political representatives? We are still citizens of member states as we are citizens of Europe. How do the institutions work together with the governments and national parliaments in providing information to the citizens? How do we continue to work in partnerships if funding is cut because of austerity? How does it really work because cooperation and engagement is not about money, it's willingness of engagement? The second question, and I think this is really interesting. You have answered the to what I heard, something like one million questions from citizens uh, last year. And that is a really impressive figure. What were the questions? And how did you reply? And where can I see it? I went to the website and I found the statistics that give me kind of a generic value of information on the scope of policies. And I've been working on this for 25 years at the EU Affairs and I didn't understand any of the global up statistics that would inform me in any way. There's a data protection issue, obviously. I've had that discussion with my colleagues. But the data protection question can be put ex ante as it well can be put ex post. The data protection issue can be a disclaimer on a website that allows people to post their questions publicly if they so choose and you to answer publicly and are sharing your knowledge with everybody else when answering that. Are you ready for that? Is Europe Direct ready for that? Or do we have a problem that goes to the heart of what we are? As an official when I was touring the UK, I was formally entitled to answer all those questions from all those citizens. And I was formally entitled to carry the responsibility for that as well. And I was managing an organization of four offices and 50 people, and I was the only one who was entitled to do that. The 49 others were only entitled on the basis of the staff regulations to answer the questions that are directly applicable to their work. Now, how are we going to solve this dilemma if we go to where people are, if we accept that people under 50 years of age no longer know how to write letters, and are less and less sending even emails, they go to Facebook, they go to online. And if you have 500 million people online, how can you solve that dilemma with 500 or 5? Is it not then the question of us, all of us, and there's more, 30,000, 35,000, 40,000 people who are on average 10 times more knowledgeable, irrespective of their grade or status, on all these issues that the people who those questions come from. And final question, the cooperation with ministers. I'm really grateful for having been invited here and I hope that I can provoke you in a, not a negative but in a positive manner. But do we really work together? 
we have means of working together, increasingly better means. Take open data. Are we ready for open data? We have discussions in different contexts like publications office, we talk about open data, we talk about open data, we know how crime statistics in countries like UK are used for people to search uh, certain postcodes and to see whether there's a nice crime apartment from there or not, or whether there are too many kill, uh, people killed in the vicinity. As institutions, we provide also a lot of data, we produce a lot of data. Could the questions and the answers that are in their thousands, or if I understand, hundreds of thousands every year, coming from the citizens, responded to by people like you, could they become also, through open data, part of a more forceful and informative tool? And finally, in that same context, the trickiest of it all, social media, Facebook. I bet that there is not one single information Facebook. point where the question of should we be in the Facebook has not been raised yet. And can you just imagine how, how unique in a way it is, considering the nature and the character of social media, that we all of them discuss them in our little silos, in Cornwall, in Seineuk, in Finland, in, 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 in France, in Italy, Portugal, but we don't discuss it here. And if the European Union isn't going to have a policy on how it interacts with its citizens through Europe Direct in Facebook, surely that policy has to be conceived together and not one or the other alone. Thank you very much for your attention.